Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, and experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful uh, individuals from around the world. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you won't miss a new episode. I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, and today I'm delighted and privileged to have a conversation with Fabian Tatner. Fabian, welcome to the program. Thank you, Fritz. It's great to be here. Now, you are the founder of the Dagmar Group, um, founder of the Homeward Bounce Project, a global initiative to support a thousand women in STEM, uh, founder of Compass, uh, the Australian Financial Review named you one of uh, the top uh, 100 women of influence. You are a Women of the Year finalist and also an, an Australia Day ambassador. And you live and work in Melbourne, Australia. Again, Fabian, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. And so there's so much topics to talk about uh, reading up on you. I just do not know where to start. So maybe I'm just going to start with the very first question. Um, born and raised in Melbourne? Yes, I was, but uh, by... Um Immigrant, uh, Im- immigrants to the country, uh, and uh, my a great mismatch in orthodoxy in my parents. My mother came from the British Raj. Her father was the last foreign affairs advisor to the ill-reputed Haile Selassie, the yeah, last mm-hmm. emperor of Ethiopia, uh, and so she came from the British Raj mentality, which was the superiority of the Brits. And my father came from an Orthodox Jewish family. His great-grandfather had been the last chief rabbi of Moscow. And so the English are very anti-Semitic. My father was a Jew and they collided in Positano in Italy. And that's where the seeds of my story begin. Oh, yeah, because you are a storyteller. Uh, And I'm going to ask you to tell a couple of stories about Antarctica, about STEM, uh, I'm going to question you on a number of quotes you've uh, made, but uh, so so it started all in Italy. Well, so. that's where their lust started, <laughs> and their love followed shortly afterwards. Uh, my father, being from an Orthodox Jewish family, couldn't marry a non-Jew, so they hitchhiked over to Australia, which was where I was born. But I was born and raised in a very creative, artistic family that were also involved in business. So I got both sides of the the equation. Okay. Now, I already alluded that you did something in Australia um, because you organized over 10 expeditions to Antarctica with women. Over the last well, day. that's sort, sort of it. So, the, you know, I, uh, I've i been involved in for a long time, both in the Southern Hemisphere and internationally, with transformational change, tackling the story of leadership and not criticising leaders, but criticising the practice of leadership, that where we find ourselves, in your own words, Fritz, in a command and control environment, yeah. but we actually need to make the shift to connect and collaborate that the practice of leadership in our world is not well set up to do what our world now needs them to do. And a long time ago, as a um, great advocate of the research that was turning up in the 70s and 80s globally, um, uh, published around what's happening to the planet, uh, I recognise that if you scratched below the surface of almost every wicked problem we have, you find poor leadership. And when you scratch below the surface of really great things that happen, you find great leadership that is collaborating and connecting. So my life's mission has been, what does it take to help leaders who have come from a command and control heritage to shift to connect and collaborate skills? What are the skills we need and how do we make it safe for leaders to make that transition? I've done that through the Datman Group with, you know, our organisation has done it with many, many thousands of people and hundreds of organisations. But you will know, as many of your listeners and watchers will understand, is we have this pernicious problem about the lack of 
representation of women. And I know different cultures approach this differently, but I started to get closer and more curious yeah, about 15 years ago about why women aren't visible. And then only to discover that this incredible human resource is much more predisposed to connection and collaboration. They're more inclined to be legacy minded. They can be trusted with assets as the famous Grameen Bank knows, uh, and yet they're not rising into leadership. So my work began with the Datna Group on women in leadership. And then in 2015, I literally had a dream. I dreamt of being on the bow of a ship and I could see women in front of me on the, you know, in a sort of living room space. I could see Antarctica through the windows. I saw the banner of Homeward Bound. I saw a film crew behind me. I knew we were making a film about the practice of leadership seen through the eyes of women. And the next morning I woke up and said, I think that's doable. I think that can be done. And um, I had the good fortune to talk to a young woman that day who was a marine biologist and a Rhodes Scholar. I told her the dream and I said, I have this crazy sense that this is possible. What do you think? And as is often said to entrepreneurs, you are made by your first follower. Your first follower makes the crazy plausible. And she was my first follower, the first person who said the idea was possible. So the rest is history, as they say, but it's a global initiative to elevate the visibility of women leading with a STEM background, science, technology, engineering, maths, medicine, four reasons. One is the practice of leadership is in trouble, not leaders, but the practice is out of date and will not get us where we need to go in the next decade. Two, there is a insistent absence of sufficient women at the leadership table. Three, why science? I wanted to discount the IQ at work in the change. So people can't say you're not up for the task, you don't know enough, you can't do enough. These are very smart people. Number four, I wanted this to be about a planet that we will proudly pass on to our children, not a planet full of fear and division. So that was the birthplace of Home and Bound, both in what the Datma Group do, but also then in an initiative that is independent, not-for-profit and global in nature. Okay. Wow, that's, that's a big dream turned into reality. I know, yeah. I know, Fritz. How did that happen? Literally, literally. If Jess had said to me, oh, that, Australians swear a little bit, so I'll try not to swear. But if she said to me, that's a load of, you know, yeah. rubbish, I would not have done anything further. But she said those fateful words, why don't you try writing it up? And I had a three-hour meeting cancelled that day and I wrote it into a paper and 10 pages later I had the skeleton of Homeward Bound and everything has come true. Because a, a couple of um, things in your story just now, which I would explore just a little bit more, uh, a, um, is Antarctica very specific or was it an example? Could it have been another place or th did it have to be Antarctica? It's funny, you know, have you been to Antarctica? Unfortunately not. You have to go because there's no place on the planet like it possibly except the top of Mount Everest. And so these are two places in the world where you will see the planet breathing in and breathing out. It's not a place. Antarctica is the planet. And um, I always knew that Homeward Bound as a name was about sometimes to appreciate home, you must leave home to turn over and look over your shoulder and know there is a place to come back to. I knew that in the telling of the story, uh, there was risk of loss of all the things you deeply value. And when you go to Antarctica, I'll try and tell this story very briefly. You leave from Ushuaia at the southern end of Argentina. You have to do the very famous Drake Passage, which is one of the worst crossings in the world. You can get the Drake Lake, which is one to one and a half metres, or you can get the Drake shape, which can be, and I've had this as high as 13 and a half metres, a terrible weather crossing. But as you get nearer to Antarctica, you enter what's called the convergence, 
which is a tide that goes around Antarctica and you enter like the famous English story, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, you enter into a cupboard and you go through the cupboard and when you fight your way through the clothing and come out the back of the cupboard, you are not in the planet as you know it. Nothing is the same. The light is different. The colours are different. You start to see icebergs, but they look like massive cities on the horizon. You start to see animals in abundance that you've seen on David Attenborough movies, not in real time. And suddenly you begin to recognise that you can't speak. You lose your language. You can say possibly three words. One I will not say in public domain. But the second word is, this is incredible. Third word is, this is amazing. And that's all you say for the time that you're there. You see a light on distant mountains covered in this creamy white ice. You, it never sets in summer. You see animals uh, in such abundance. You hear the sound of whales breathing. You hear and see animals living in a space that is about the future about breeding, about beginning again, and there are no human beings there except scientific bases. How do we even come to understand that when we look at your map and know that that whole map is covered in people? Okay. I understand Antarctica now a little bit better. Thank you for that. The picture frame yeah. of Homeward Bound. I got that. One other thing which I want to come back to, you said um, the current leadership is becoming outdated. So what ha what what's changing? Well, I don't think it's becoming outdated. I think it is outdated. In fact, it's worse than that. The word I use in English is moribund. It's mm -hmm. dying. Structural hierarchies are going to kill us if we can't hear the wisdom of the crowds. If as leaders we can't come into the centre and choreograph potential. Now, there's very big differences in how countries around the world will adapt to this change. There are many cultures that will struggle with the idea of treating the people at the front line of business as equals. There are countries that will find that easy. Uh, it's interesting, New Zealand and Australia will make the shift relatively easier. It's easier to do. Uh, huge countries like China and India will struggle where the power structure is quite different. But sooner or later, we will make the shift. Uh, and you're seeing it globally now in the disconnect between employees and leaders, referred to as resignation. Uh, we we recognise this is a time of significant change. We don't quite know what to do with it yet. So we live in an... Uh, a futurologist uh, once told me that we live in an age of chaos. Yes, sure. So we're all struggling to, uh, that we are reinventing ourselves. And that's what, what you also are observing and trying to do something about that. Well, you, I, you know, the, the concept of volatility, uncertainty, chaos and ambiguity have been around for quite a long time. Uh, scientists predicted what we are in at the moment and the rest of us weren't paying attention. This is an order of chaos and uncertainty and ambiguity that most people who are not scientists can't wrap their heads around. It's been predicted since the 70s. We are now in the change. So the uh, period of stability on the planet is finished. We are now in the Anthropocene. This is a period of deep instability that we are entering into planetary-wide. So I say to people, open your eyes, look up, pay attention to the science because we can deal with it if we are paying attention. If we deny it, we're in trouble. So it's materially different from where we've been. Okay. Um, I'm going to... Come to a quote. This is a good segue to um, a quote I found uh, you um, having said somewhere. I'll read it out to you. Uh, I had to face who I was as a leader. And I think uh, that I saw things I did not like about who I was. 
basically I look like a man. <laughs> yes. That are, we, is a... are, we, are we so bad that we, I mean, it, well, it seems quite I, I black should, and I'm white. Gonna, I'm going to frame this by saying, um, you know, I'm married for 37 years to a man I deeply love. I have three sons who I deeply love. And uh, I still don't want to look like any of them. And so, you know, I don't know if any uh, of your audience have been in a film, but when I dreamt of Homeward Bound, I also dreamt of a film. But the film is very different from the film that was ultimately made by Bunya Productions called The Leadership. And when I saw myself on film, a bit like everyone, when you get a photo taken, you tend to say, oh, my God, my stomach is so fat or my bum is too big or, geez, I look like I need to do some exercise. Uh, not many people look and go, oh, I love what I look like. Well, I have to live with the fact that a 90-minute theatrical release film's been put in, out into the world and I am one of the central characters in it. That was never intended at all. And what it showed for me is aspects of how I came across that I didn't like about myself and needed and wanted to change, more importantly. Too strident, moved too heavily through space, mm -hmm. um, thanks to my mother, by the way, and a, con a, a conscious awareness that there are things about incumbent leadership that is not a criticism of men per se, but is an invitation to change. So I'm a very female female on the full spectrum of an intersectional world and it is not my desire to look like you, Fritz, who, handsome as you are, I do not want to look like you. And when I saw myself on film, instead of being who I am inside, I was something else. Okay. Uh, I... Um... Now I understand what uh, what, you, um, what you're referring to. Um, by the way, uh, in your work, in your life, uh, how would you define success? How does what does success mean for you? Um, well, because I spend my life coaching leaders, and I know that a lot of emerging leaders, young leaders, will be listening to this. Uh, I think success is the concept of success is as risky as the concept of failure. So I think failure and success are often external measures. You know, can I be seen by other people to be mm -hmm. successful? Uh, I've achieved something. I own something. I've earned something. I've made something. Failure can be seen at the other end as the absence of those things. I say to, to leaders, young, middle-aged and old, far better for you to concentrate on the internal measure. Am I fulfilled or am I depressed? Because at the intersection of fulfilment and success comes abundance. And I track for a combination. And I'm always tracking for how do I feel about what I do? Um, rather than whether someone externally thinks I'm, I'm successful. I'm not motivated by money, although I have what I need in life. I am motivated by feeling like at the end of my life I've done everything I can to support the transformation of the practice of leadership. So I'm constantly searching for ways to increase insight for leaders uh, we lead very big transformational projects around the world now. Lots of coaching and development of leaders to inspire them to transition into a connected and collaborating world. And for a lot of leaders, particularly the lads, mm -hmm. the men, that can feel quite threatening. So how do we make that transition safe and loving, not threatening? That's yeah, take us a little bit how that works because, uh, I mean, I do recognize the type of people you're referring to who see this as a threat. So how do you take the threat away? I mean, you said about so the first thing love is and compassion. You, you don't, was... Yep. So first no. thing is you, you don't sit in judgment. So mm -hmm. we will be commissioned by an organization, often an executive team that are in trouble, struggling, uh, um, dysfunctional behavior, um, uh, only talk task, 
there's a long table they meet at and the president or the CEO sits at one end and everyone has an official place at the long table. Uh, it's not a collaborative space, it's a power space. And when we talk to the other leaders, we hear how fractured the relationship is. When we look into the organisation, we discover that this function or this division of the business is very critical of another function. They are not talking or communicating. In fact, they're judging and criticising. In the flow of work, people often do that piece of work we are responsible for and pass it on with no sense of who else is involved. And so we will begin the work with executive teams to change the dynamic in the executive team. You can't change the organisation if you can't address the dynamic of an executive and build trust. And then you can start to cascade leadership development to other levels. Uh, always our focus is on a sustainable future. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other is startups, uh, which are often full of the ideal in the absence of appropriate controls and structures. So uh, the idealism that fuels startups needs to be protected and nurtured. But what can happen with young and emerging leaders is a little bit of arrogance. So we've read the textbooks, we've listened to the TED Talks, we know how we want to run, it's collaborative, no hierarchy, you know, everyone has a voice and suddenly there's chaos. And what you hear uh, in the R&D area of the business or production side is no one really knows what's happening or who's in control or whose responsibility it is. So always our focus is the flow of how organisations work and can emerge into the structures that they want to last the distance in the next eight years, which will be a continuation of the last three years, increasing volatility and uncertainty. Okay. Now, Fabian, I'm hearing two examples, one in the more corporate world, uh, one in the startup world, but in both examples, uh, no mention of specific uh, women or female leadership. Um, do you then uh, point that out? Is that something you then infuse in the system or um, how do you tie what you just said? We need more female leadership in those two examples. Sure. So a lot of the work, so we have three pillars to the work we do. We do this form of consulting to inspire people about what's possible. We have a big middle approach to transformation coaching. So if we are going from A to Z and our world is very different now, we have to build people's sense of agency or resilience to manage that transition because otherwise our world will divide and we will hate and we will judge and we will blame. We help people say it's okay. We help people to manage the fear of transition and the skills of transition. And the third pillar of what we do is elevating the visibility of women leading. Now, that means from the most ordinary space to the most sophisticated. So we run public programs which include people from all over the world. Uh, I have a emerging leaders program uh, with 40-odd leaders from around the world that started in Helsingborg in Sweden as part of the Urban Futures Leadership Program. Uh, Urban Futures uh, uh, Conference, I'm now running a leadership initiative. We donate that because we believe the emerging leaders, if they're helped, are our greatest influencers. But then at a, a, a more uh, corporate level, we will do... Uh, what we call honesty audits, find out what men say about leadership and the fairness button or equity button with women. Do they see a difference? We then ask women the same question and we compare their answers and their answers are very different. Then we help them look at the answers. So we do three things. We do, do he says, she says, we say. And so, again, it's always about bridging the gap because the ultimate outcome is there's no gender in leadership. But when the pendulum's been all the way over towards men, pendulums don't swing into the middle. You've got to create a momentum to get to the middle. So helping women is part of the shift out of an old paradigm to be more inclusive. But the ultimate win is when there is no, no separation. Got that. Now, now I'm finally getting the picture why you take the approach you're taking. Um, now, I was wondering in all your um, years experience uh, working so far, uh, what are the key milestones in your life, in your career, which really help you learn something? 
Um, I would probably, um, there was a really big milestone when I was about 15. Under the dining table in my parents' living room, so this was a, a big dining table, imagine a Bruegel-esque uh, table full of uh, fabulous food and lots of red wine and painters and poets and would-be politicians sitting around the table. And I was with the teenagers underneath the table. And as the late lunch progressed, the parents and the adults and the friends above the table would get a little bit tipsy and we would sneak the red wine under the table and we would have a miniature event happening under the table. And on one very famous occasion, sitting around the table were a group of very uh, now famous Australian painters, but they weren't then. And I remember a conversation between a man called Sidney Nolan, who went on to be one of Australia's most famous and internationally, internationally recognised painter, talking to a young painter who was successful in Australia but not big internationally called Albert Tucker. Uh, Albert Tucker was maybe 30 and Freddie Williams must have been in his 50s, maybe late 50s. And Tucker had just had an exhibition that had failed and people had said he had the demon in his paintings and he was no good. And he was crying at the table. And Freddie Williams, the older painter, was patting him and saying, you must remember mankind does not move forward on the back of sameness. It moves forward on the back of difference. Keep going. Stand for something or you stand for nothing. My 15-year-old brain grabbed hold of that sense of purpose and it became a guiding light. Then um, I went into publishing and I lied my way into my first job and um, the managing director discovered of a publishing company that I couldn't spell. Uh, and instead of firing me, he gave me three months to learn to spell and, in fact, the very famous Heinemann Australian Dictionary was built on the principle that if I couldn't find a word in it, the editorial team had to go back and work out how I would find the word. And I learned to spell. So I've, I felt I learned about the courage of learning and feedback. I then uh, went into law for, as a second degree for a period of time and my father was very sick and I was invited back into the family business that was a fur business, fur and leather. I'd been an animal rights activist for most of my life. I now join the family business and I trade off my values to care for my father. And, you know, six, seven years after I joined, the business closed in the global recession in 89-90 and I learned the cost both personally and financially of not standing by the things that are important to you. Then time marches on and I build a business and uh, I catch someone very important in my life in business with their hand in the cookie jar, uh, breaking the spirit of trust in our relationship. Um, and I had the skill not to be angry and I learned the power of a constructive mindset in the presence of very deep conflict. And so I managed a separation and an exit in a deeply constructive way. No one was hurt. All that we said is that is over. We now separate. And it was done with grace and kindness and the right spirit for a very old relationship. And then finally, the big lesson was homeward bound. Uh, both the dream and the courage to follow the dream uh, and then to not give up after the first voyage uh, and to face into the criticism and change. Um, so I keep going. You know, I keep learning and challenging and exploring and investigating. Yeah. Do you have a, a, a North Star in your life, like a guiding principle? So, well, that's what keeps me going? Uh, compassion is more important than cleverness. Well, you've demonstrated a lot of compassion in your stories, uh, Fabian. Um, I'm going to ask you just one last question. Um, 
because you already covered so much wisdom in, in your uh, talk right now. How do you want the world to remember you? I don't. They don't? Not really. I'll be happy that uh, when I die and take my last breath, the hand that holds mine loves me. Um, I hope that my family live healthy lives and feel able to deal with the world they're in. I hope that my contribution has done a little bit towards a more sustainable future. But, you know, um, the universe is ancient. The time during the evolution of a universe in which something as precious as this earth can exist is tiny. And I'm pretty confident our species is unlikely to be here for much longer. We look at what happened to the dinosaurs. They have been around for a very long time. We've been around like 150 million years. We've been around for 150,000 years. I'm not sure we will make it to the next 100. So I have no ego around it. I'm not interested in, in what I'm remembered for. I'm, I'm deeply interested in what I do with my life and that I add value now. I think that's good advice for a lot of people for, uh, watching this, for every, anybody actually out there. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your lessons uh, of life uh, with us, uh, Fabian. Thank you and thank wish you all the best. Thank you, Fritz. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.